Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 204, we're going to talk about the big four or what to look for when buying tube gear. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Before we get into today's topic, we'd like to mention that a new video is up on our other channel, Melatone Amps. And today, we'll be talking about rolling amps. Yep, you heard that right. Not rolling tubes, rolling amps. And if you want to know more, follow the link below. Okay, you are just getting into tubes and have no idea what matters and what doesn't. Or you've already dipped your toe into this wonderful hobby and started with an inexpensive Amazon or Chinese amp and you want to upgrade. And yes, even a cheap tube amp can sound amazing compared to most solid state amps. But there's far better sound waiting for you. So what's important when buying a new amp? And what's not important? Well, everyone can guess what number one is. Yep, the tubes. Be careful not to buy into a piece of vintage gear that uses difficult to find tube types. And also check out the availability of quality vintage tubes before you buy. Yeah, there's some vintage amps out there that use some very, very obscure power tubes and preamp tubes. And you really don't want to get into those whenever it's probably going to cost you more for the tubes than you paid for the amp. Yeah, and there won't be any support later on. Um, now, some of the rarer vintage tube types have actually been picked up by modern manufacturers. And that's safe, but yeah, it's do your research. <laughs> uh, we get emails every week from people looking for weird tubes and Charles will go on the hunt. It takes him an hour to two hours to hunt our old inventory. And, um, and yeah, and, uh, sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of modern amps are going to come with something like a new sensor, a JJ, or some other Chinese manufactured tube. And that gets me back onto the script. So it's fine to start with an inexpensive set of new sensor. New sensor is all those um, those old brand names uh, like Mullard, uh, Gen Sol. Genelex Gold Lion, uh, you name it, uh, pretty much all of those old brand names that are slapped onto um, new tubes are new sensor. Uh, JJ, uh, also a very common uh, uh, low-cost modern tube, or Chinese tubes. And the, um, the big Chinese factory, um, Shuan, is back into production, as far as I know, uh, and should be pumping out tubes by the thousands. Well, we're seeing their advertising everywhere, that's for sure. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, over time, you're probably going to discover that those modern tubes have sonic limitations. It takes a little while to get kind of tired of uh, the problems. I mean, one of the most common emails we get is about JJ6SN7s. Do all 6SN7 have this harsh um, uh, mid-range, upper range? And the answer, of course, is no. In <laughs> fact, no vintage 6SN7s have really a harsh mid-range or, or treble. At least none that we've heard, and we've heard a lot of them. Yeah, so uh, check on what's available, because it would be a real drag to discover that the original vintage types are either incredibly expensive or worse, extinct. So, And also a drag if you can't even buy them anymore, unless if it's a new production tube and incredibly expensive, like uh, 300 Bs. Or 6550s. Yeah. Who said 6550s? <laughs> well, I did. And it just so happens that the 6550 Svetlana, the real Svetlana, they got rectangular openings in the plates. This is the C version. This is the one you want. We actually found quite a few of them. We still have some quads left in stock. And this is a good example of a fabulous sounding vintage power tube that is in short supply and will soon go extinct, but is currently available, but they're expensive. So that has to figure into your equation. In fact, 
Um, I tell people who, um, particularly in Facebook groups, who are complaining about how much tubes cost, that really, you, whatever you've paid for your amp, um, you have to really think that you're going to pay at least as much for one set of tubes for it, a good set of tubes. Because, why is that important? Because the tubes are the amplifier. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if we're talking about a small signal tube like a 12AU7 or a 6SN7 or a big power tube like the 6550. Everything that gets amplified, whether it's voltage with a 12AU7 or a 6SN7 or current, like with the 6550 or a KT88, is done by the tubes. It's not done by the circuit. All the circuit does is set the operating point and and basically control the operation of the tube. Okay, um, well, number two is coming up. Let's, let's reset the, uh, the table and we'll be right back. Number two is harder to guess. I'll give you one hint. They're heavy and expensive. Okay, that's two hints. Yes, we're talking about the transformers, or iron as many builders call them. This is hard to figure out if you're buying a tube amp that's already manufactured, but you can read the specs and look at the pictures. If the iron looks to be big and well made, that's a good sign. If the manufacturer actually talks about the quality of the transformers, that's a really good indication that someone cared. Oh, wait a second, we've got the wrong transformer on screen here. This isn't one we use. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a comedian, Charles. Um, but yeah, that's, that's very uh, appropriate because this is actually the, um, the Hammond power transformer that we use in all of our um, kit monoblocks, the GU50. And um, it's, you know, to make, um, to make the, a higher powered, great sounding, pure class A amp needs a big piece of iron. And it's a big chunk of what, why that kit is so expensive, because the, the transformers are so expensive. And, of course, it costs money to box them and ship them, um, and it just you know, keeps on going. Yeah. If you see a, a new amplifier out there that doesn't have a decently sized power transformer on it, chances are they're probably doing something a little strange with the voltage. Either they're running the tubes at very low voltage. You know, you'll see some tube amps out there with a 12 volt DC switch mode and that's all they have powering them. Avoid, avoid, avoid because they're not running the tubes at a good operating point. Or they might be using a voltage doubler, which can maybe be okay. Um, it wouldn't be my preference. And, um, and don't, I mean, never forget that when you think about the tube gear and what's powering things up, whether it's a preamp or whether it's a, a, a monoblock or an integrated stereo amplifier, doesn't matter. The transformer is really the first major component in the power supply and if it's just barely making the spec uh, for the current rating of the amp, Chances are it's not going to sound as good as it could. And to make um, to make a great sounding power supply takes a fair amount of experience, uh, careful design work, probably a little bit of magic needs to go into there, and um, and a high quality transformer will make all of the difference. If you start off with a cheap transformer or something that's uh, basically underpowered or just barely powering up. Uh, to meet the spec, um, you're just... Uh, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. And remember, um, uh, amplifiers are essentially just very complicated valves between your wall plug and your speakers. <laughs> and this is probably one of the most com important components after your tubes. Okay, well, what's up next, Charles? Ah, the circuit. Ah, number three, the circuit. If a schematic is published, that's always a good sign the manufacturer is proud of what they've designed and wants you to be able to investigate the circuit further and later on uh, to do repairs or even perhaps modifications and improvements. We always publish complete schematics and many amateur builders make clones of our designs. 
Most manufacturers, including kit manufacturers, don't publish the schematics. But the better ones will actually discuss the circuit, and that's also a good sign. In fact, I've got up here um, the what is the it's a draft, but it's the final schematic for our new modern line six or twelve SL seven slash six N six P phono preamp, and um, the the design is very similar to um, our classic line. Uh, preamp and sometimes when you when you find a schematic for an amplifier they won't give you the power supply and there's lots of reasons why they won't do that but one of them is that they they really don't want you cloning the amp and we yeah. we do that yeah, we're, we're happy if you clone the amp yeah we're even happier if you buy the kit but <laughs> you know there are a lot of reasons why um, people can't afford to buy a kit or they just like to put their own components in and I figured that we should give back to the community so we've published every single um, commercial design that we bring to market has a complete schematic and in fact this is the first time I think we've ever shown off a schematic for uh, a product that's not quite in the market it's coming it's coming yeah uh, we might have shown them off a little bit before but <laughs> this is still a, a bit down the pipe here yeah now if you're just learning your way around schematics um, uh, we've got quite a few videos in which we talk about a particular um, amplifier that's coming or a circuit that we've designed and you can go back there's we've got uh, we must have a dozen or more videos and in those videos we actually talk about what these components are what they do why they're important and um, you can slowly if you're just just learning your way around a schematic you can start to learn and it, it'll start to show you what is important and what's not so I'm just going to give you a couple of little um, uh, tips here and here's our RCA signal in jack right here and here's our signal shown and its phase is shown and it, it, as it gets amplified in later stages it gets bigger or the phase changes you can see how the phase inverted here it's not always easy to see on some people's schematics where the signal path is uh, sometimes especially on older schematics the layouts can be kind of vague and, and different compared to modern conventions now this is a fairly complicated uh, little preamp because it's got to do the ri double a equalization right it's going to take what's on the in the groove of a vinyl record um, and take that eq that was pressed into the record and restore it back to uh, n the normal signal um, and as a result we've got a, a bunch of things in here that are really important that are specific to uh, the equalization but you can follow through at least the signal path and say to yourself how many components are in the signal path well we've got a little resistor here that's a, a grid stopper we have the signal comes off of here we have a coupling cap another resistor this resistor sets the impedance of the equalization so it's absolutely critical that we see the signal here and we see the phase inverted because it came off of the plate we have another grid stopper here signal comes off another amplification stage through another coupling cap you see how we follow it through it goes on to the grid of the cathode follower and we take the signal off of the cathode follower stage and uh, one more coupling cap and we're out so slowly over time you can start to learn and, and we have simpler schematics than this too <laughs> if you want to start with something a little easier <laughs> <laughs> yeah in fact the new preamp which will come out first the modern line 6n1p has a really simple schematic and we're going to do a video on that maybe on our other channel in which we talk about the secrets of why the preamp sounds so darn good and a lot of it has to do with the tubes but the circuit is uh is really nice too yeah 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 well you're just saying that because you designed most uh, of it maybe a little pat <laughs> on the back <laughs> you did a great job though um and you did an amazing job on the on the pcbs mm -hmm. yeah very happy with how that turned out in the new chassis yeah yeah and you'll you'll be hearing more about that okay 
So what's up after this? Number four, components and layout. Quality components are important. They don't need to be exotic or expensive so long as they're well made they'll work just as well as an expensive boutique part. The idea that the sound can be significantly improved by replacing the resistors and or capacitors is mostly false. I'll repeat that, mostly false. Now, before everyone starts typing in caps in the comments section below why I'm wrong, remember we listen to tubes, circuits and components every day of the week. We do this for a living. And we do a lot of A-B testing on components like coupling caps and resistors and uh, oftentimes it's very difficult to tell if there's a difference. Now, if we're talking about vintage tube amps, they will almost certainly need to be substantially rebuilt with quality components. Even modern manufactured tube gear can have room for improvement and in some cases need upgrades installed for both sonic and safety reasons. I've got a whole selection of components that we use in our kits and in our prototype work. Things like circuit boards. Uh, for years, circuit boards were really kind of crappy. I can remember when all we had were single-sided and now what are we up to? Quad-sided oh, boards? Oh, they're well beyond that, but uh, we still use double-sided in almost everything we're doing. Yeah, and we use thick, heavy boards. And one of the big problems with a lot of inexpensive amps is they use thin boards. And if, if it's a bigger board, this is a really tiny board, but if it was a bigger board and it's got heavier components on it and it gets dropped, what happens is the board actually flexes. And if there's a trace that's not very heavy or supported properly, then the board will flex and it'll actually break the traces or the components that are soldered onto the board. So quality boards, yeah, if you can look at a picture of a complete amp that you're thinking about buying or better still actually have a good look at the actual amplifier inside, be careful. There can be high voltage present, so don't go poking around inside of an amplifier unless you know what you're doing. Um, and you see really good quality boards, nice heavy ones, big traces, big pads. That's a good sign. Well, that's a, that's a good point too, especially if you're going to be building a kit. How easy is it to work with those boards? How easy is it to solder to them? Now we put oversized pads and we try to fit everything as well as we can on our own PCBs because we've dealt with a number of kits over time, not just audio kits, but other electronics projects that are just horrible. They'll They're put these tiny little pads, uh, they won't have anything labeled. Uh, everything will be bunched together in a tight little cluster while the rest of the board is, is empty. It's, um, uh, we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nobody should be cursed with a bad PCB, especially if you have to build it. Um, here's a selection of one of the, the highest wearing components in any piece of tube gear, and that are the electrolytics. Here's a couple of big filter caps. These are Nishikons. That's a good quality manufacturer. Careful, there are counterfeit Nishikons all over the place. Um, and uh, the thing about electrolytics, and these come in all different values and sizes, is that they have a very finite lifespan. Now, the better quality of the cap and the better design the circuit, the, um, the, the longer uh, the lifespan of the electrolytic, which is why uh, we spend probably two or three times as much as most manufacturers would. And um, yeah, so and if you have a piece of vintage gear that is over 15 years old, there's a very good likelihood all of the electrolytics will have to be replaced. I mean, we were working on one of my reel-to-reel -reel machines that was mm -hmm. built, what, about 1982, I think? Yeah. So that would make it... Um, uh, about 40 years old and they had put high quality electrolytics in it and most of them are still good but we, we had... still swapped them out though we want it to last another what 
20 to 40 years at least. <laughs> well, I'm hoping I got another 30 years in me, but I don't think I got more than that. Um, so yeah, so electrolytics, really, really important, but things like sockets, you know, nobody thinks about sockets until you start plugging in and rolling tubes on a regular basis. If you don't have high quality sockets and you have to replace them because they're worn out or they're not making good contact, or the amps become noisy, they're a major pain in the tuskus to, to replace. <laughs> That's a big job. If it's soldered to a PCB, it's an even bigger job. Yeah. Um, but also pay attention to how the pins of your tubes go in the sockets because sometimes they have these shielded and if dirt or grime or something gets in there or if the receivers need to be adjusted, you're just not going to be able to do it. So your sockets will have much shorter lifespan. RCA jacks. The signal has to get plugged in, whether it's an XLR or a, an RCA jack. And um, it's that's absolutely critical because if there's no good contact there, you get scratchy sounds really easy. Even things like switches. We use switches that are, you know, maybe a hundred times overrated for what <laughs> yeah. their duty is. Uh, but that gives us an incredible duty cycle. So a duty cycle just means how many times can you do this? Yeah. If you're running a lower voltage through the switch than it was designed for, then you're going to have less of an arc every time that, that internal contact touches and there's going to be less degradation of the contacts. Yeah. So if the manufacturer of your gear put in over over spec switches, that's going to make a big difference as to how long it lasts. Volume pots. There's a, this is a blue Alps. Here is, um, here's this one of the, one of the really great uh, stepped attenuator uh, switches. This is a 24 position switch, I think. Uh, two pole, 24 position, yeah. Yeah, now it doesn't have its stepping resistors mounted on it. Um, but um, yeah, the volume, whatever is controlling the volume, that can make a huge difference. Now these are, these are passive and very analog, but these days a lot of equipment's using um, using uh, digital switches and um, for a lot of reasons you're not going to see those in our kits. Uh, I don't think that, that really have a place in, um, in a simple high quality uh, class A amplifier or preamplifier. But um, if they do, if your amp does have uh, digital switching of some sort, just, um, just be aware that uh, repairing it could be a real a real bear and hopefully hopefully um, it hasn't that kind of switching has not been around that long so no i don't think anybody really knows how long lived it's going to be will it will it still be viable 25 40 years from now so if a blue alps pot uh, gets scratchy it can be cleaned and if it gets scratchy beyond repair, let's say 25 or 40 years from now, it can be easily replaced. So and the same goes for a step attenuator switch. So yeah, and I think over here we've got some coupling caps and uh, we've talked before about coupling caps and anything that's in, I think the, the mid uh, range, so high quality manufacturers like Solon and Vichy make amazing quality coupling capacitors and even though they're not cheap they're not incredibly expensive either and they sound absolutely amazing and i i know that somebody's going to jump into the comments and say caps make a huge difference and it's true coupling caps do make a big difference but the biggest difference is going from an inexpensive i don't have an expensive one here but if you had a, a really cheap you know, 25 cent part versus, you know, a five or $6 part. Yeah, there's a that's huge- That's where you're gonna see the biggest difference. That's gonna be a huge difference. If you go from a $6 part to a $60 part, the difference, the incremental difference gets really, really small. Um, and I think in some cases, the difference is actually how the EQ is affected by the cap. What you really want with the capacitor is nothing. <laughs> you just want it to pass the signal and not do anything sonically and that's the ideal coupling capacitor it doesn't take anything away and it doesn't add anything now that's the ideal man it doesn't exist but we can try to get as close as we can for a reasonable price yeah yeah and you know some really intrepid builders of our kits 
uh, we'll upgrade the coupling capacitors and we get notes quite often from builders saying I tried this and I tried that and honestly it made a you know a nice little bit of a difference uh, or sometimes I've made so many changes to my preamp I don't even know for sure you know what made the difference <laughs> so in fact that's one last piece of advice before we go if you're going to do some upgrading on an amp and um and you have, let's say, three upgrades that you want to put in place. Don't do all three at the same time. One at a time, then listen to it. Yeah. Well, and make sure it works too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully that helps you in choosing uh, your next amp or upgrading your amplifier or bringing uh, a vintage amp up to spec. This could go on forever and ever. So we better say goodbye. It was a slow week for new tubes coming in, but we actually have a huge number of tubes coming in probably for next Friday. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, so it's going to be exciting. Um, we found a lot of really interesting stuff. So there are cheers codes to help you save some money, and there's actually a code that's really easy to figure out, and a lot of people grab it, and it saves big bucks <laughs> and costs us lots of money, and that's that's just great. So we can reach almost everybody with $20 flat rate shipping. And if yours is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.